John? Yep. You got the roll call? Veronica, we still got a few more people. While I start roll call, please. Yep, working on it. Thank you. All right, Miss Joanna Anaya. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Johannes Camino. Bryn Davis. I see Bryn, but he has it. Bryn, are you here? Are you muted? Yes, he is. All right, I'll come back to him. Dale Decker. Here. There hey, this is Bryn. I'm here. I just couldn't find the button. <laughs> Thank you, Bryn. <laughs> Deborah Heckes. Just moved her over, so she should jump on shortly. Philip Ingram. Mark Lee. Deborah Moore. Here. Joshua Orozco. Here. John Rockwell. I see him. John, John Rockwell. Are you muted? Here. Thank you. <laughs> Nancy Sauer. Nan is not going to be able to join us till later, but she does think she'll be here later. Matt the cynic. Oh. Hmm. Vince Alvarado. Miss Kelly Orth. Is that right? Is that correct? Yes, present. Thank you. Director Rodriguez. Here. Deputy Secretary Clark. I'm here. Bobby Eric. Here, sir. Thank you. Carla Kugler. Here. Samuel Colapo. Representative Montoya. Here. Thank you. Secretary Serna. Here. Deputy Secretary Madrano. Present. Senator Hamblin. Here. Daniel Schlegel. Mayor Snover. Councilor Sorg. Ezra Spitzer. Director Trapp. Here. Director Perea. Give DJ another shot at it. Sure. Deborah Heckes. She's, she says she's here and we see mm -hmm. her. D D DJ, are you on mute? Uh-oh, she just left. No, she's still on, but it looks like she's not able to, to like voice her. Do we her have presence. quorum? <laughs> we do not we have, have quorum. quorum. We do not have quorum. If we have, if we had her here, would we have quorum? No. She says she's here and she can hear me. Okay. Well, all right. So we haven't had this happen in a really long time, but uh, so how far away are we from quorum? Three off. We need three, three, three business people, three business people to, to come in. Carla, can you hear says, me? Car yes. Okay. De Deborah Heck is here. Carla says he hasn't been called on. Carlos I was did. waiting. Yeah. It didn't Go sound ahead. like it was alphabetical. Yeah. Carlos Romero. Yeah, so here's who I have missing from business. I have Joanna Anaya, Philip Ingram, Mark Lee, Nancy Sauer, Matthew Sinek. Okay, so Nan believes she's going to be in the meeting later. Um, and so that would give us one. So if anybody knows any of those other people and wants to send them <clears throat> a text real quick, that would be fabulous. Um, the only agenda uh, item that we needed to vote on uh, this for this meeting is the approval of the minutes. So if we fail to achieve quorum, all we'll do is we'll just uh, vote to approve the minutes next time uh, for the sake of eliminating, um, you know, many, many, many roll calls. The way that we've also structured our meeting is to to say uh, 
I, I open the floor. Does anybody have any changes to the agenda that they would like to suggest? And if so, then we would have, we would have a, a vote on that. Not having quorum, we can't do that. Um, but does anybody have any changes to the agenda just in you know, case we can get to quorum and I'll come back to it? Okay, great. So, so we're just going to proceed with the agenda. So today really is a lot of um, a opportunity for us to hear um, from a, a lot of voices about a lot of things that have gone on. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, with the good job grants overview. And um, Yolanda, just to be mindful of Troy's time, I, I, I kind of let him know up front, we would be really, we would try to get him yeah. done sooner because he had a conflict. Um, but do you want to talk about the good jobs grant? Sure. And it'll be really quick because I just wanted to let the state workforce board know that we did have five grantees that submitted applications. There were over 500 plus applications that went in nationally, uh, but New Mexico had five, which was not bad at all for a very small state. Um, California and Texas, they all ended up like submitting like 30 plus grants. Uh, but smaller states like New Mexico were submitting one or two. Uh, we had five that went in total. Uh, the grants are there's one from Central New Mexico wait, Community wait. College. Wait, what okay. is a good what is a good job oh, grant? Okay, <laughs> so the Good Jobs Challenge um, was uh, funds that came down as part of the uh, infrastructure money or the money at the federal level around um, funding that was made available to states to actually um, speak to and work with specific spec, uh, sector work to develop and actually implement jobs and create jobs in that particular sector. So they had to not only come up with the strategy of how they were gonna go up, but they also had to guarantee that there were gonna be good jobs. And good jobs are jobs that would lead to sustainability and self-sufficiency. So things that would lead to um, really strong wages and really meet the demands of what's going on in the region or in that community around um, a specific sector. Um, so the grantees in New Mexico, one is with CNM Community College. Um, I didn't get a word back from them. I was trying to get uh, an idea from them and how much they had applied for. It's called the High Skills Technician um, and the Workforce for New Mexico's Future is what they're calling it. So they're gonna be working and continuing um, it sounds like work that's associated with their IT uh, challenge grant that they had. So they had an IT grant that is expiring, and I think this is a way for them to expand that. The second one is also, uh, it's not also, but is from uh, Dona Ana Community College. And also I have not heard from these folks, but their grant is called Stimulating Advanced Manufacturing 4.0 Good Jobs and Career Pathways in Southern New Mexico. And this one is going to be with the DACC Borderlands Workforce Training Center and Innovation Hub. So they're going to be working predominantly around the, the increase of the manufacturing jobs that are coming out as a result of the way that that Borderlands piece is, um, is all changing in that, in that area. The third one is with New Mexico Navajo Technical University. Um, this one was submitted by the Na Navajo Economic Development Collaborative. Um, I had attended um, a meeting with the Native American uh, Economic Development Summit that they had. And this one is really gonna be around just um, the, the application or the increase of jobs around uh, a Native American communities. Uh, and this one is specifically just for Navajo, uh, for Navajo Nation. So it'll be really interesting to see um, how that all plays out and if that's gonna span that Northwest area, but also into the, the Four Corners area. So we'll have to get some more information on that one as well. I've not heard from the folks that applied for that. Uh, the fourth one is the Central New Mexico Economic Development District the nor and in Northern New Mexico. And this one is called the Workforce Integration Network. It's a sectoral approach to training and careers in healthcare and the skilled trades. They did apply for 5.3 million. And this one has a pretty organized community piece that they're doing um, a strong partnership with Los Alamos uh, National Labs, but also with Northern uh, University. Uh, this one has, they did a lot of work in terms of organizing the communities 
and the partners around that. I've attended several of their meetings. And so it's going to be really interesting to see how that one all plays out. Um, I do have a really good summary of their of their application, and we will be part of their um, of their ongoing advisory committee if it's funded and when it's funded. Uh, they asked for 5.3 million. The fifth one is the Workforce Connection Center of Central New Mexico. It's called the Real Jobs Alliance of New Mexico. Oh gosh, and I forgot to pull up the. Let me pull this up really quick. And they asked for 13.3 million, uh, and this one is with a partnership. Let me pull it up here real quick. So, so this one is um, it, it is a partnership. Um, it's going to fund the Connection Center as a system lead, but it's a partnership with the University of New Mexico as a backbone organization to form what they call the Real Jobs Alliance. Um, they've requested 13.3 million and um, pr pretty much focused on IT tech, healthcare, and community safety and construction industries. Uh, so, so this one again is also um, sector work and um, we're hoping that they get that because it's gonna allow for some flexibility in terms of flexible funds that they could use at the workforce uh, level uh, with, the, with the way that they do eligibility and bring folks in. So we'll also be a, a partner with the Connection Center of Central New Mexico. We'll be a partner with them on their alliance as they're working and moving forward. The other three, I need to get a better partnership with them and find out who they are and what they're planning so that we can actually have a seat at the table around any kind of advisory work and making sure that we can coordinate with them. The goal for me really is around sustainability because once these funds run out, you know, what are we gonna do and what can we sustain? So I'm hoping that it builds some good infrastructure around um, the way that we could uh, think about workforce development and sector work. So just wanted to give you all that information and I stand for questions if anyone has any questions. Anyone on the board? This is Representative oh, go ahead. Montoya and I'm, I'm curious about, you mentioned the Northern Board and Los Alamos National Labs. Is there any way that you could loop me into that? Absolutely, work? absolutely. Yeah. I, I it, will... It's critically important, thank you. Yes, yeah, so Camila Bustamante is the one that is um, sort of leading that group, but I will abs I would be more than happy to send her a note and tell her that you want to be looped in, and the next time that they have a, a, a committee meeting, it would be great to have you there. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative. Um, Josh, did you want to get looped in to the one going on with DACC? Yeah, it's probably a good idea. <laughs> just checking, <laughs> just checking. Josh needs more things to do. He he. Yeah. Every time I call him, I'm sure he cringes. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, I think I I think this. I mean, these are all really great, and I'm real curious. Maybe in the future, especially as you're wrapping your arms around this more, I would love to know more about what the industry side of these partnerships look like. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's a future conversation. Are there any other comments from the board before we move on? Okay, great. Well, thank you guys. Um, I am so happy. And would you please do me a favor, Veronica, and make Troy a co-host? I'm going to turn my camera off in case this is an issue for any reason. But um, I'm so happy that Troy Clark was able to join us today. Um, what we are trying to do as the state board, understanding, right, that we, you know, we're primarily business, except apparently today, because we don't have quorum by a couple people. But, you know, with all of these people from these various sectors of business in the state, really understanding what we're hearing, what, what, what colleagues are saying, and really, really surfacing these, these high value industry sectors and their workforce needs, meeting by meeting, is really, I think, something we can do to lend to the conversations that are happening on the ground, you know, happening at the at the level of the person sitting across the desk, you know, from somebody um, in one of our workforce connections offices. So I uh, asked Troy Clark, who did join us, by the way, for one of our community listening sessions, 
He is the president of the New Mexico Hospital Services Corporation. And I asked him if he would kind of speak to broadly in the state, we hear a lot about nurses, but the healthcare community needs tons more than that. So Troy, um, thank you for joining us. And I just wanted to ask you if you would be willing to just kind of give us a conversation about what are those high priority things you're hearing statewide that we need to focus on with our workforce dollars, our sector strategies, and from an investment perspective. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, I keep clicking the button to start the video and a message pops up that says I have a face for radio and uh, it won't allow me to click the video on. I don't know what's hey, happening. Veronica is going to make so. you co-host. You're good. Go, <laughs> go, now. go ahead, Troy. You, you're good now. And then who's going to show his slides? Do you have your slides? You can either share your screen or. I've got my, yeah, I can do it if that works. I'll yeah, you should, you there, should so. be able to share your screen. All right, let's see if that works. There you go. All right, perfect. Thank you, Tracy. And thank uh, we appreciate the opportunity. Uh, obviously, we've been trying to get involved uh, and I uh, did join one of the community uh, listening sessions and uh, sit with one of the on the central uh, board uh, for workforce, really to try and make sure that we stay plugged in and you get to hear from us as well. And so uh, I appreciate also the discussion that uh, it isn't a presentation as much as we hope it's a discussion. So if you've got questions, uh, Tracy, Veronica, whoever monitors it, I. If you'll just uh, interrupt me, that's fine. It does not bother me to be interrupted one bit. Um, but I am uh, Troy Clark from the uh, New Mexico Hospital Association. And I thought I'd do a little foundational work uh, at the beginning of the presentation here to make the rest of it really hopefully make more sense uh, to us. And so the New Mexico Hospital Association represents 47 hospitals across the state. It's easier for me to tell you who we don't represent uh, as members or who are not members in our group. And that is the Indian Health Services uh, facilities, the Veterans Hospital. Both of those are federally run facilities that really don't have a lot of state uh, regulatory involvement or interaction, which we do most of our work. We do some at the federal, but most of our work with the uh, state level agencies, either Department of Health or Human Services. Uh, and then the state run uh, mental facility in Las Vegas, uh, New Mexico. Other than that, all of the other hospitals, uh, both acute care hospitals and our post-acute hospitals, so behavioral health, uh, rehabilitation, long-term care facilities are members of the uh, hospital uh, association here. And that represents rural, urban, academic, specialty. We have a broad range, no different than everything else in our state, where it's geographically diverse, culturally diverse, uh, we have that same situation. We have privately held uh, hospitals that uh, have taken up the charge to be able to provide health care in some of our communities that we're grateful for. We have nonprofit uh, facilities. We have county owned uh, special hospital district run, which are kind of a quasi state uh, county uh, set up. And our hospitals have a very broad range of services. All of these things prove uh, to contribute to some of the difficulties uh, when it comes to workforce that we'll talk about later. Um, our hospitals in the uh, state of New Mexico are primarily the largest employer in most of the communities we're in. Uh, if you uh, go out of Santa Fe or out of Albuquerque, we're the largest employers in the communities that we are in and have the highest paying jobs uh, typically in those communities. We are a very economic uh, stimulating uh, enterprise within those, uh, as well as trying to support the education in those areas. And we'll talk about that combination there. Uh, but in 2019, nearly $12 billion of expenditures in, directly into New Mexico economies, not going outside of that. Uh, 7.1 billion spent directly by the hospitals, another 4.8 in secondary expenditures. 4.6 billion of that is labor income. Uh, directly into our communities in this uh, state. Uh, so today I thought we'd kind of get a perspective of the rural perspective and some of our folks in Albuquerque and Santa Fe and Las Cruces may say, well, we have hospitals too. I will tell you that uh, as I look across at the hospitals throughout the rest of the country, our entire state is rural. Uh, we have four communities that have more than one hospital. 
Uh, that's Las Cruces, that's Albuquerque, Santa Fe, and Roswell. Um, and outside of that, every other uh, community that we have a hospital in, they're the only hospital in that community. But when there's still a lot of rural uh, related challenges as we look on a national level that have impacts into Santa Fe, Las Cruces, and Albuquerque. Uh, we'll talk about what we need, and it's why we're here today. It's about workforce. It's what you uh, all are committed to with your time and resource, and why I appreciate the opportunity to spend uh, some time with you trying to help uh, share with you where, where things are for us and where we're headed, uh, what the pandemic has done to really exacerbate that problem. Uh, and how we are breaking through the bottlenecks. And if I don't say it again, uh, I probably will. I want to thank our legislature. I know we've got a representative and a senator on right now who really saw the needs that we've got, uh, both for the hospitals directly, but also uh, at the end, I'll share some of the things we're doing really that I see for the first time in uh, decades of having been under a nursing shortage to start to address it with some long-term solutions. So to give you a little bit of background, if I took uh, all of our hospitals across the state and averaged them out, if you wanna look inside under the covers kind of of the financial operations of a hospital, this graph shows you what their expenditures look like and how they're spread across. It should be no surprise that healthcare is a people business. 55% of all expenses leaving a hospital are labor related. Uh, then you get into your medical supplies and your uh, other costs to actually run the physical facility. But uh, when it comes down to actually running the hospital, the driver, uh, far and away, salary and benefits uh, of our facilities. I love this graph. This uh, is something I've got from the American Hospital Association that has a dot for every hospital in the United States. Uh, I've outlined New Mexico here, and part of the message is if you look at the dispersion of the dots through New Mexico, look across the rest of the country, and the only other state that is uh, dispersed with their dots is Nevada. And that's because Nevada has a big hole in the middle of it that we all know is Area 51 that we really don't know what happens there, but there are not people there, so it's no surprise that there are not hospitals there. Uh, you get to where their population is, and Nevada is, has about the same density other than their Las Vegas area, which I believe has nine hospitals. Uh, we have a situation that is very different from the rest of the country. If we were to lose one hospital from our state, it is much like a spider web that no matter where you touch it, it will have an impact on the entire healthcare ecosystem in our state. We have, if you go outside of Albuquerque, uh, Santa Fe, and Las Cruces, our hospitals, with the exception of two, are 50 or more miles apart, many of them 80 to 100 miles apart. There we go. So here's the state itself. So you can see from the communities you're in where uh, our hospitals are located and spread across. Uh, I mentioned two communities. You got Loveless or Lovington and Hobbs, where our hospitals are 20 miles apart. You got Clovis and Portales uh, that are 20 miles apart. Uh, and then you got Los Alamos and Española. Other than that, if you were to take any one of those hospitals and due to financial uh, strain or other reasons, close it down, not just the distance between the two hospitals, but the distance that uh, citizens already have to drive, if you were uh, out in some of these far reaches, Catron County, there's many people who've got a two and a half, three hour drive to get into Socorro already. Uh, you take away the Socorro Hospital, uh, not that that's happening, but you can see the distance and drive you would have to get to to get to other uh, facilities becomes very great and a real detriment to access for healthcare. So having said that, what are the biggest challenges we've got? And this affects uh, Albuquerque and Santa Fe just as well. Recruitment and retention both. Typically in most states, you're gonna go out and recruit on a national level uh, to get people to come to New Mexico, especially when it's providers, you have got to find the individual who wants to be a big fish in a small pond. Uh, the individuals who seek for the big pond, the big uh, city amenities, the New Yorks, the Chicago's access to those often look over uh, New Mexico. They uh, look over it because when it comes to being a provider, there's limited backup. 
it's one thing to come in, especially if you're a specialist or a, a physician who works in a hospital environment, you can't be on call 365 days a year. You need some personal time. Uh, and on top of personal time, being on call every night uh, that you're on when you're not out of town is also a huge strain on your family. And so for most of our communities in this state, if you come in as a specialist, you are one of one or one of two of those specialists in that community. It takes a, a very intriguing person who is willing to be that big fish in a small pond mentality to say, I'm willing to take that burden on and really be on 24 seven. And I highlight that because it may seem little to each of us, but I have a number of physicians that I have talked to in our rural communities who choose to do their grocery shopping at five in the morning because it's the only time they can go to the grocery store that they don't get a tug on the arm or a tap on the shoulder that says, hey doc, glad to see you. I've got this issue, can you please help me? And so they really are in a mentality where it's not just practicing within the walls of the hospital or just practicing within uh, their clinic it's at the Little League games, it's at the school events, it's at the grocery store, it's at the gas station. It is constant. And that is the situation I will tell you in really every community outside of uh, Las Cruces, uh, Albuquerque and Santa Fe. You are a jack of all trades. We have uh, a unique thing here that I've not seen in my 25 year career in other states where we have uh, general surgeons who are also primary care physicians. We have primary care physicians who are also licensed as general surgeons. They have a practice where they deal with chronic care management and outpatient environment, and then they'll go into the walls of the hospital and do surgery. That is not been seen in this country since the 1970s. But in our small rural communities, you have to become the jack of all trades where that capability is lost. And it's very difficult to recruit as those individuals who have those skills retire. None of our new physicians are trained that way. You are uh, boarded in your specialty and you practice within your specialty. And in fact, your fellowship, uh, your boarding within your fellowship restricts your ability to extend outside of that unless you go get a second uh, formal training and fellowship in those uh, practices. With nurses, uh, we see first year turnover of 30 plus percent. We have many of our nurses who take the time and effort to go through and get their nursing license and then come out and start to work in the field and become very overwhelmed. It's not what they thought it was. Uh, so first year, our overall turnover uh, pre-pandemic was running about 15 to 18%. Uh, in some years, it would spike up to about 20. But first year turnover is always that driver to it as people become more acclimated to what the real life is of working as a nurse uh, in the workforce and they make other decisions and choices to take up other careers. We have a very mobile workforce. This has been highlighted uh, in the pandemic where our uh, travel nursing has become exponential. And I'll share with you that uh, pre-pandemic, the majority of our hospitals would have less than 1% of their staff be traveler or nurse uh, agency nurses from the spring through the fall. It was only when you had an unexpected resignation or retirement, somebody moved out of town. Usually during the winter months, we would augment our staff to meet the increased uh, demands that take place in the winter months with respiratory illnesses. And you may have workforces at our larger hospitals that got up to five or 6% of their staff were agency or travel nurses. During the pandemic, we had last August, 12% of our workforce across the entire state was traveler. By November, we were up to 15%. And some of our hospitals were as high as 60% of their staff, their nursing staff, were agency or not uh, permanently employed nurses just to fill the positions to meet the demand that we've got. Do you anticipate that that is going to continue to, to be that high? Or did we see an attrition and, and we have several to fill? Or there's like there's a shortage just overall? Or was that just to meet the demand? Um, Yes, yes, and yes. So uh, I do expect it to continue. Uh, I, we hope that it begins to decrease, but I don't think it's going to be a rapid decrease. Uh, part of that is what we've seen in the pandemic. Uh, if you go a year ago, 
the uh, vaccine was released uh, in late December, early January, and we started to see hospitalizations drop from a high of about 950 to by, I forget which month it was, I wanna say it's April or May, we were down to less than 50 hospitalized people for COVID. Our hospitals were still running at 140 to 160% of occupancy with non-COVID related patients because okay. people had delayed care and things had gotten worse. So even, and I don't want to jinx us, but it looks like we're in another uh, very positive downturn uh, and hopefully a decrease in the COVID-related diagnoses, but right now our hospitals are still very full. And we expect that same thing to happen, that as people are more comfortable uh, getting their healthcare needs early on so it can be dealt with on an outpatient basis that we won't need to see that volume. We hope that some of the natural transition or uh, exhaustion with the pandemic caused people to actually get the care they needed in the last six months. And it may, may not take as long to uh, trickle down as it did last uh, after the vaccines came out last year. But uh, what, even when we were down to less than 50 COVID diagnosed hospitalized people, uh, we were running, like I say, 140, 160% uh, exactly. June, July, and then all of a sudden, uh, the Delta variant came in and tacked in on top of it. So, and just with relationship to those nurses, did you see a shuffling? So, did they have to leave like the local health care, right? Maybe a community health center to go to the hospital. And so, are is there kind of going to be this like movement back to the community health center side and away from the hospital? So, the answer is like our state, it varies. And that really varied on the size of the hospital system. Hospital systems that owned outpatient clinics, uh, surgery centers, outpatient surgery departments did shuffle people. But what we did not see much of a movement from what I would consider the independent clinics, whether they're the federally qualified health centers, the county clinics, or independent practitioners into the hospital. So we didn't see movement between employers, but within an employer, we did see that movement and shift. And uh, those hospital systems did that to try and meet more of the demand is within their own facilities. Thank you. Uh, so the, for nursing also outside of the pandemic, there is a draw uh, to urban areas. It's difficult, more difficult in our rural areas to keep them there because oftentimes you get nurses who want to be specialized. I want to be an OB nurse. I want to be an oncology nurse. I want to be a, a surgical nurse. Whatever their specialized needs are, that many of those specialized uh, services are either not available at all in their community or so limited in numbers that they then move to the more urban areas in order to meet what their career ambitions are. In a rural area, they have to wear many hats. We have some communities that don't have respiratory therapists. The nursing staff are trained and have to be both a nurse and a respiratory therapist. Uh, they may have to work in a medical surgical department as well as the emergency room. They may have to work in obstetrics as well as an ICU. There's a lot of uh, variation that takes place in our many communities where those hospitals uh, have structured their roles to meet the demands that they've got, but also be financially viable and sustainable. Uh, in many of our small communities that do obstetrics where we deliver babies, uh, there's not enough babies delivered to have a dedicated OB department. So you have obstetrics nurses who are multitasking. I know of one facility that they multitask back and forth between the medical surgical unit and OB and another one that uh, they alternate back and forth between the emergency department. That is not something you see in an urban environment and makes it one more challenge to keep people in those rural areas, especially if they have specialized interests. What do we need? Uh, I thought it was interesting when I talked, uh, when I was contacted to talk about this, I pulled up this slide, which actually came from January of 2020 before the pandemic. What do we need? It's the same thing we need today. It's workforce development. And you'll see the next line on here, uh, very near and dear to my heart. Uh, we need homegrown nurses and doctors. We will continue to try and recruit outside of Albuquerque. Uh, I'm sorry, outside of New Mexico. But other than Albuquerque trying to bring people into the rural parts of the state, and even to some extent into Albuquerque, we spend an awful lot of time with recruits trying to convince them of why to come to New Mexico and why New Mexico is so great. And there are some that come here and find that they love it and they understand it uh, and agree. There's others who won't even give it a chance. It's, 
it's some people don't even realize that we're still part of the United States. It's kind of sad to realize the uh, education level there. Uh, but overcoming the obstacles of education in our local communities is tough. Uh, finding incentives to recruit people outside are great at the federal level. We have some uh, federal loan repayment dollar programs, but unfortunately, and we even have some state ones, I want to make sure I cover both, but unfortunately those require a three-year practice commitment. And the typical pattern is for these nurses and doctors is they get there for the first year, uh, figure out what their job's like. They spend their second year looking for where their next job is and their third year winding down their practice and moving on to the next job. It is almost a guarantee that anyone we bring into the state on these federal loan repayment programs, the state loan repayment programs will only stay for the length of what their committed time is. They don't get involved and integrated into their communities and stay. Um, we also look to help in the state really what you're doing in increasing the number of jobs in the communities to reduce our dependence on Medicaid. Uh, we see that as the way out. Uh, while we believe that Medicaid uh, is not fully funded, if you look at what happens with the Medicaid program in our state, we our Medicaid payments cover about 85 to 90% of the cost, not what's billed, but the cost of providing that care. If we can find enough jobs and employment to reduce the number of enrollees on Medicaid and keep the funding dollars where they're at, we'll be able to get that up to where Medicaid covers the cost and improves our healthcare access. So we see that as the way out as opposed to trying to uh, constantly tax ourselves more to get more dollars to fund Medicaid for an ever increasing number. And what we saw during the pandemic, unfortunately did the opposite of this, that our Medicaid percentage has now grown to where about 46% of our population is on Medicaid. Uh, and then we look for financial support to renovate and replace aging facilities. We're not going to talk a whole lot about this today, other than just for your awareness. Most of our rural communities, uh, their facilities were built in the uh, 60s and 70s under a federal program called the Hill-Burton Act. Uh, and they have enough uh, financial sustainability to meet the daily operations, but not to invest in uh, replacement uh, facilities or infrastructure that they've been relying upon that was paid for uh, decades ago. So what has our current crisis done? We kind of touched on this. Yolanda asked a question earlier. It's exacerbated or highlighted really the weaknesses that we've got. Uh, where we were used to as a uh, healthcare system, adapting and using travelers, using overtime to make up for nursing shortages over the last decades during the winter months, when those demands became so great and became year round, we had no way to meet that demand. Um, it's created a financial impact on the hospitals. I talked about what an economic driver we are in many of the uh, facilities. Uh, this graph shows you that uh, over the entire pandemic, our net hospital losses have now exceeded 420 million. But there's really another story to this that drives into what we're talking about. And that is, there's really a tale of two stories to the pandemic. Uh, in this first graph or first bar on the graph, you see the pandemic related losses that uh, staffing makes up about 400 million of the loss. You've got supplies that make up a little more than 100 million. And then you have lost revenue that makes up a great uh, amount as well. Uh, it's about 400 million as well. That pandemic lo related loss of revenue really all occurred in the first part of the pandemic. And I'm gonna come back to that because I wanna catch one more here uh, slide here. In the media, uh, what's been shared out there is the federal monies that have been uh, dispersed throughout the uh, nation to hospitals that are out there. And the numbers seem very big to people, and they are very big. We received about $374 million into the state from the federal government directly to hospitals to help. And in your daily life, you think 374 million, most of the people I talk to go, hospitals should be just fine. That's a ton of money until you see the total of all the expenses that go out the door. It helped fill about half of the hole that was created to our state. But going back to where I was headed with the tale of two different periods of time in this uh, epidemic, really the first year of the epidemic through January of a year ago, the majority of the losses, as you see in this graph, were due to lost revenues. 
our hospitals had to shrink back down, reduce services that they couldn't provide as we had to adapt our facilities to try and meet this new pandemic that we were not used to. We had to spend money on ventilators uh, and other equipment to take care of COVID related cases and also to protect all of our other patients uh, who didn't have COVID and our staff from contracting COVID and making certain that our hospitals were one of the safest places to be in spite of the fact that we had COVID positive people within there. Notice in this graph, the 23%, 146 million in the first period of time was related to, uh, in a one year period of time was related to staffing. As I change the graph to show you the second half of this pandemic or the second story, we don't see any lost revenue anymore. I just told you that uh, in Yolanda's question about our volumes, our hospitals have been bursting at the seams. We don't have lost revenue. We actually have about $92 million more revenue than we've had before. And on the bar graph, that was the other great uh, portion above the federal funding was this additional 92 million in revenue. However, just in the last six months, our hospitals have incurred $247 million of premium pay over and above what they would normally pay for the staffing to keep their hospitals open and staffed to meet the demands. It really is two different uh, worlds and phases of this pandemic, and it's put us in a position that has highlighted and that exacerbated this uh, worker shortage that we have. This is all healthcare workers, and while often it's talked about uh, nurses and the nursing shortage, we've had a nursing shortage for decades. We've had a provider shortage, physicians and nurse practitioners in this state. Now, as a result of the pandemic, there is not a healthcare position uh, that we're not short on. That includes ultrasonographers, uh, radiation therapists, it includes respiratory therapists, includes uh, your housekeepers, your dietary, your maintenance. There's not a position in a hospital that we are not short on and having to outsource in facilities across the state to uh, agency or temporary help. So what's that done? We're in a position right now where nurses are nearly impossible to find and keep. Uh, both within our state and nationwide, nurses have left the uh, uh, industry. They've chosen other careers or chosen to retire earlier. 12% uh, I mentioned of our staff uh, positions are filled with travelers as of last uh, September. An additional 17% of our positions were vacant. So put those two together, that's, ne that's nearly a third of all positions are filled with either temporary or unfilled positions. Traveling nursing contracts, Pre-pandemic, we would spend $70 to $80 an hour to get an agency nurse in. A employed nurse runs about $30 to $40 an hour. A year ago, those nursing uh, rates had moved up to the $130 to $160 an hour, and we're competing for these nurses on a nationwide basis, so demands elsewhere drive this. We saw spikes when the hurricanes hit down in uh, the southeastern uh, part of our country, made it even worse. We are now seeing $230 to $265 an hour, depending on whether it's an ICU nurse or a med surge nurse. So when you compare that to a normal rate of paying $30 to $40 an hour, depending on the specialty, we had been running three to four times. We're now seven to eight times what the normal cost is. Four out of five of our nursing jobs remain open due to nurses leaving the field faster than we can replace them. Uh, UNM had a study out that uh, has now been quoted by us many times and throughout the legislature uh, that we are over 6,200 nurses short in our state as we sit here today. Troy, oh. I want to I want to stop for just a second. All right. Um, so so this has been an before the pandemic. To your point, um, Secretary Serna was leading an effort specifically around nurses. My conversation all along has been what you just said health care workers, regardless of level, we struggle with those shortages. My concern has always been that there's not a shortage of people willing to go into this profession. It's that the pipeline that produces the profession is completely clogged and can produce no more. So like, are you guys in the conversation around how to expand the capacity of our training pipelines or no? Tracy, you, I teed you up beautifully and I didn't even do it. That's right where we're headed next. And it's, um, 
with this, let me finish this comment here. We're going to go right into that. Uh, of what and I want to be done. mindful of time. I'm so sorry, Troy. We, we yep. still have some other things, but let's keep going. So currently, we educate less than 1,500 a year. Last year, we cert graduated and certified 1,200 nurses. So if we had no one retire, if we had no one leave the profession, no one leave the state, it would take us five years to fill the current void. That's it. That just doesn't work. Uh, so Tracy, great lead in. What have we done? Over the past 20 years, there's been efforts in pockets. And unfortunately, all it has done is move the bottleneck around. Because the bottleneck that creates this pipeline is constricted because there's really three key areas that have to contribute to make this happen. One is the nursing association in trying to get everybody through the process, get the number of nurses interested. Two is the education system to be able to actually educate and train those. And three is the hospitals where all of the clinical rotations are done. Any one of those on their own trying to deal with the issue, which is what we've seen, and not just in our state, in my career across the country, everybody tries to deal with it on their own. And all you do is move the bottleneck. If you don't increase the number of education slots uh, and enrollments at our higher education, you're not going to have a need for more clinical rotations. You can increase the clinical rotations in the hospital all you want. And if nothing more is coming through the pipeline, it's not going to work. On the other hand, higher education isn't going to increase the number of slots if they can't get them into clinical rotations, because then they have a bunch of nurses who are book educated and miss all of the on hands uh, or hands on clinical experience that they need to meet their certification. And by the same token, if you don't increase the number of educators we have, you can't increase the number of enrollment slots. And so uh, our legislature this year uh, heard the voices and responded. We appreciate it. There's $15 million coming in. Uh, it is a one-time uh, funding that needs to become recurring. And I think there's a lot of interest. They want to see if it is going to come to reality. But this was a bill brought uh, or a uh, request brought by the combination of higher education, the nursing association, the hospital association working together to really do three things. Increase the wages for educators. Unfortunately, in our state, unique to our state, education uh, related compensation was uh, capped at your commensurate level. So said another way, a math professor or an English professor would make the same as a nurse professor. They can make 20 to 30% more pre-pandemic and now with traveler nurses to go out and work in the clinical field. People were not willing to take a reduction in compensation to go in and teach. So part of this 15 million will go to increase educator uh, Compensation, will, which will also help us increase the number of educators that we've got, allowing our nursing schools to increase the enrollment that they've got. Part of it will go to our hospitals. Uh, I'm sorry, it will, our hospitals have increased, are willing to increase the number of clinical rotation slots. Part of this will go to the students to be able to do their clinical rotations in hospitals that currently don't offer clinical rotations because they're out in rural areas where students can't afford the travel and housing costs to get out there. So we have a lot of hospitals that would love from a recruitment standpoint and from an extra hands-on to be able to get people from their own community back into their community doing their clinical rotations because then they become employed in their own community and drive that economic benefit as well. And so uh, those are the two main components. The third piece it, that will be implemented in the second and third years is then going out to the middle schools and high schools to drive the increased interest into the program so that as we increase enrollment, we actually fill those slots. And getting uh, the high school and middle school kids hands-on experiences to be able to become really interested in healthcare careers. And that way they can start to do a lot of their dual credit work during their junior and senior years. And it only takes them two years once they get out of high school uh, to be able to get their uh, associate's degree RN certified and actually out. Troy, just so that I'm, I'm all about connecting dots so that people don't duplicate efforts, I just wanted you to know, so New Mexico has been given uh, two different federal grants um, to be really the first in the country to have career-connected education. And uh, there's, there's now a scripted curriculum from sixth grade to twelfth grade that'll be rolled out in the fall semester that allows um, 
uh, students to have career exploration in the context of application in science, in social studies, in English language, uh, arts, and in math. <clears throat> and I think there's a couple other ones, but, but integrated into this curriculum are a number of careers in healthcare. And, and it provides an, like a window into what the, you know, what the job does and what kind of people like that job and what does the job pay and what is the outlook for that job. So before you go off and do something separate, I would highly encourage you, and I will help with this, connect with what's already going on so that if you decide to go and do some more related to this last bullet, that let's, you know, let's do, because I think what, what, what would be great is to have more individuals standing in front of students. You know, I think that's part of the solution, but I, but I, I just want to make sure you're aware of that. So I'm really being mindful of time. We're coming up on the top of the hour. Is there anything further you want to share with us before uh, questions? Dale Decker has a question, but is there anything further you want to share? That was the end of it. I will say that uh, we are aware of that. And that's what I would like to, I've had a conversation with Secretary Cerna about this. Uh, and Tracy, I think I would highlight and say, because of the high level of visibility of nurses, this is focusing on nurses. Legislature passed this, but it really is. We need to expand this to all healthcare. We're mm -hmm. currently working on a federal grant for respiratory therapy. I would love to work with uh, the Workforce Solutions area to try and expand this to all healthcare workers to do the same thing and not only present in front of students, but we have some pilot programs where the students get to come hands on and work in this last bullet point that we talked about in integrating those two together. So let me, okay. uh, let me I take will, some of the questions that are out there. Well, and I wanna connect you with Elaine Perea so that you see who, who's normally here and I don't think she's here today, but I wanna connect you with Elaine Perea so that you have a sense of what's going on within the K-12 system. Dale, your hand went up first. Yes, Okay, sir. good, I was jumping the gun there. Great presentation, uh, Troy, good to see you. Um, Good to see you, Dale. So while, while you were doing this, I was multitasking and I Googled uh, best states to be a nurse 2021. And believe it or not, New Mexico came up as number five, which is, uh, is, is good information. And I would think that would be uh, good for uh, New Mexico to go look at the bottom five states. Um, which were surprising, like Mar Maryland, Delaware, Vermont, and several others were at the bottom of that list. But then I also Googled best states to be a doctor or a physician. And New Mexico came up as the number 14 worst state to be a physician. So we have this kind of oxymoron, you know, you, on one hand, maybe it's good we can recruit nurses. On the other hand, it sounds like we have a state that isn't very friendly uh, or perceive very friendly to physicians. And since we all use the internet to figure out everything that we're gonna do in life, lists matter. So I'm just curious how you uh, see how we, what is, is there structural things that we as a state can do to make us more attractive to, to getting physicians here? You know, there are, I, I can raise really quickly, uh, I, I'll let you know that's improvement. In 2018, we were the 49th worst state. So uh, doing the reverse math, I guess that puts us at 36 now. Yep. Um, however, in our last year's session, unfortunately, we had some medical malpractice reform that went the wrong direction for attracting physicians. I expect us to regress that. Uh, yep. But I can tell you the highlighted issues that we see in recruiting physicians are one, the items that I mentioned, the rural nature and having to be a big fish in a small pond. There's, there's just a much smaller pie of potential physicians that are interested in that. It's our medical malpractice environment. It's our uh, gross receipts tax uh, environment uh, on their income uh, that are our biggest uh, barriers that we see in the recruitment uh, of physicians bringing them into the state. Thank you for that. And I, I'm sorry, I missed the biggest. Oh, go one, ahead. The high Medicaid population. Yep. And end of it, we, we have the one of the highest percentages, if not the highest percentage of employed physicians uh, in our state, because with the high level of Medicaid and the low reimbursement level for Medicaid, it is very, very difficult for an independent practitioner to have anywhere close to the earning uh, capacity that they have in other states. Thank you for that. Brand. Hi, Troy, how are you doing today? Doing great, thanks. Um, I might have missed it, but you had talked about, the, I'll call it the 1500 or the 1250 in the pipeline and the gap. What is our anticipated attrition rate? I mean, are we pouring in 1500 and losing 1500? Are we making any headway? 
Well, right now we, uh, the data is hard on that. And I'll tell you why it's hard is because it, historically we've looked at the number of licensed uh, nurses and we have a lot of nurses that work here under a compact, uh, a reciprocity agreement. Uh, and we have a lot of nurses that are from our state to work elsewhere, but to our best uh, guess right now, we are slowly losing more to retirement and moving out than we are gaining, but it's pretty close to breaking. Yeah, so that means that means without major change, we won't ever get to even start chiseling away. That's My correct. We, we really believe that we need to get the enrollment numbers up uh, well over the 2,500 number to start to chip away at this. My, my other question is, do you have or, or do you plan to have any um, method to track if you are training what I'll call local, you know, out of local communities and putting them in, if your, your retention rate of keeping them in state is better than external? And I, I say that I'm in the utility side. And when we try and train linemen from out of state and do all that, they come, they get certified and they leave. So we, our programs are always looking for local people because they want to stay. So... The answer is yes, we're going to track a couple different things, uh, not only the uh, placement and where they are placed after they go through the program, the number of enrollments at a university to uh, or community college or university to qualify for these uh, grant funds out of this 15 million, you have to demonstrate that you actually increase enrollment uh, beyond where you're at, and we're going to be looking at the uh, number of uh, rotation slots for the hospitals for the nursing students to qualify to get the travel and reimbursement costs, they're gonna to have to go to hospitals that prove that they actually increased or began, obviously, if they didn't do it before, it'd be an increase, the number of clinical rotation slots. So there's a number of different tracking mechanisms to make certain that we hit the outcomes that we're uh, looking for. Uh, and I'll just, I'll leave with, and when we've done some of this for, because as Dale knows, I'm a data guy, what we found is in order to preserve and anonymity in that is we just tracked them by zip code of where they were educated and zip code of where they work uh, in our stuff. And that's a pretty good way to benchmark without tipping too many cards. Yeah, the great news, a lot of this effort, uh, obviously, volume wise will flow through UNM and New Mexico State who have more robust uh, tracking programs already in place. The smaller programs actually feel like they have a much higher success rate because they don't have the, even though they don't have the higher level tracking programs because they have small numbers and it's easier for them to track. In fact, most of them, if I have a conversation with them, they can name by name the nurses that left their program in the last four years. Cool, thank you. Wow. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Montoya. Troy, thank you so much for the presentation. I, I want to speak just briefly about the educational pipelining that you described with middle school and high school. While I completely agree that that immersive, experiential, putting those industry leaders in the schools and vice versa is important, but I worked for 25 years in the Española Public Schools integrating arts learning. And what I learned overseeing 13 elementary schools that <laughs> it's not too early to help children understand their passion and purpose as early as third to sixth grade so that by the time they do reach sixth seventh and eighth and we're kind of pressuring them hey what do you want to be when you grow up we've already identified as an educational continuum that really highlights where that passion lies in a child so it's not just the industry of healthcare; it's every possible smorgasbord of options as we pipeline our young people forward. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Montoya. Thank you again to you and your peers for passing the legislation. And I couldn't agree more. I will tell you that most of the focus uh, has always been in the high school areas. And while there's a great program that Matt Probst runs up there in the Española area that is focused on high school, we have a more successful program that we've seen down in the Rio Doso area where they've moved down to the middle school and Using their words, they say, we try and catch them at the middle school area before they're interested in boys, girls, and parties. Uh, <laughs> if we wait till high school, uh, we probably are missing our opportunity. So the whole concept of moving at a younger age, I think is very well understood and agreed by. Thank, Thank you. you so much. You. I also believe that Secretary Steinhaus is very much of this, this mindset. And I think that the educational re reforms we're seeing not only in funding, but in strategies, Yep. are going to be open to this. Thank you so much. 
Excellent point, Representative. Thank you for that. And Troy, thank you. All right, Amber, you are our last hand. Okay, I'll be brief. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Clark, this has just been uh, sobering and fascinating for me. And I'm curious about, so I know that across the country, the registered apprenticeship model is expanding rapidly, right, to meet the needs for frontline healthcare workers. And it's only one approach to training, but there's some benefits for it in that it's a job. So getting people into the clinic and in the hospital faster and ultimately promoting retention. And another benefit being that it can be a partnership with higher education, but not necessarily fully dependent upon higher education because of you know, um, sources of sponsorship and training outside of it, you know, whether it be unions or hospitals or employers, what have you. So you know, another thing that appeals to me about it is that young people are right out of school, but it can, can take advantage of it, but it's also a really good model for returning adult learners. So I'm just curious if you have any reflections on this as a beneficial approach in New Mexico and what's already being done. You know, it, I appreciate the question. Unfortunately, I have to say, I don't know that we have made headway in identifying specifics of a program, but we have identified that this is actually another area that historically has been a uh, great success, but trying to identify a program to put together to put for funding, we haven't figured that one out, but we're still working on it. And I'll share a, one of my favorite examples, our chief nursing officer at our hospital in Santa Fe at Christa St. Vincent's, started off as a dietary aide at St. Vincent's Hospital. Moved uh -huh. to a cook, was convinced to become a clinician, went to nursing school in her adult years, has worked her way up through management, is now the chief nursing officer. It, it's, it's a great recruitment, a recruitment tool and a retention tool, but it's a great uh, outreach to our employees as well and helping them continue to develop. And we see often within our, the walls of our hospital, people who are in non-clinical jobs that uh, show interest in becoming clinicians. And that has to exist outside of the hospital as well. People who are in other jobs that have an interest in uh, clinicians, we just have not perfected that one yet, but it is on our radar screen. Thank you so much. Uh, I see that, uh, Greg, you have raised your hand as well. Do you have something you wanted to talk to Troy about? I do. Um, one of the really untapped resources that I think that we have in this state are military spouses, military families. And some states I know have um, enacted new laws that allow for uh, expedited occupational licenses or um, in some way to uh, allow military spouses to get a state license, including for nurses. Have we considered anything like that here in New Mexico? Uh, New Mexico actually uh, last year passed uh, one of those. It is a great help having run the hospital uh, for a period of time over in Clovis. There is high dependence upon Cannon Air Force Base, and we love spouses. <laughs> we love significant others. Uh, we hate when they leave because they're only there for three years, but that's actually, it's a great point. It's something we pushed and we've got that expedited, expedited licensure uh, process now in the state because that's one of the few times that we actually see or a few areas when you're close to a military base where you see heavily experienced uh, nurses come in uh, to the recruitment pool. Wonderful. Fantastic to hear that. Other than that, you're usually... Is that Troy or is that me? That's Troy. Troy, yeah. Troy I am so sorry. You froze up on us. Uh oh. Well, Troy, I I, I want to say if you can hear me, I think I think I'm not sure what's happened, and I think his signal got lost. I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for for really, this is incredibly valuable time. And, you know, those, those of, you know, the rest of the people who are in this meeting, who are the workforce system that make, <laughs> you know, that, that, that are, are helping shepherd people into these high, high value careers, high wage career progression, um, you know, taking advantage of these opportunities. You know, I think it's really helpful for you guys to have a sense of, you know, where the opportunities are. And I, 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 I always, I always highlight, it isn't just doctors and nurses, though they are central, but, but you heard it. It's the respiratory therapist that that nurse is having to fill that job. It's the surgical tech. It's the, 
diagnostic medical sonographer, it's everybody. And so, you know, I'm really thankful that we are having these conversations about some of our most important sectors, because I mean, especially this one that affects all of us. It affects all of us um, in the state. So, and it's really, I think, a vital contributor to quality of life in our, in our rural and our urban communities. But I'm not sure what happened with Troy's feed, but I thank him for being here. And I'm so happy it didn't go out before he left. Um, I wanted to, now I'm gonna have Marcus uh, Martinez is gonna talk to us about the work that's been going on within hospitality and tourism, which as you know, has, you know, had quite <coughs> Bren, do you mind muting yourself? We I'm did, so sorry. Muted. Okay. So, so, uh, uh, so board chair, we're just gonna, we actually have a replacement. Oh, there's for, a replacement. For Marcos okay. Martinez, we're going to introduce Mary Milet, who okay. um, actually has been working on this project. Uh, Director Marcos Martinez is on his way back from Carlsbad, so he didn't uh. quite make it here on time. But uh, Mary has been working with this project and can give us just an update on what the intention of the project was and where we are overall right now. Um, I thought this would be really important for uh, the board to hear because you probably have seen a lot of, there was a, you know, a high, uh, just a, people were very nervous and anxious about um, the hospitality industry really needing workers. And so we, uh, we addressed that concern. We came to, to support them. So I'll turn it over to Mary Milet. Great. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, yes, yeah, so I've been working on this program um, since I guess late last year, um, 2021. And, you know, we're looking at this from the perspective of, you know, COVID restrictions, uh, workforce shortage, and we really saw that the hospitality um, and tourism industry was hit hard over the last uh, two years now. So we've put together a program, um, our hospitality training reimbursement program that offers training assistance to either new employees or promotional employees. Um, and the reimbursement is a range ranges from $816 to $4,480, depending on um, the employee's classification. So being that it's in the hospitality sector, uh, we looked at tipped versus non-tipped, and then of course, full-time and part-time. So that's where we get that range from. Um, of course, there were, I'll go over just briefly some of the parameters um, of the program, but it, of course, um, focuses specifically on the hospitality industry um, and businesses operating in New Mexico. Um, each application had a limit of 10 workers per location. Uh, so for some of these larger businesses that might have properties throughout the state, uh, they could have multiple applications and have 10 employees um, considered on that application per location. So that was really helpful. Um, and then each position had to pay at least uh, $12.50 per hour. Um, and then new employees could also be considered, but they would also have to uh, show an increase in pay. Um, and then for the food service industry, at least 25% of the new hires um, also had to be tipped employees. So we, we put in some of those parameters and it's been, um, we started taking applications early December. Um, and we have right now, we have 114 applications. Um, that's a total of 681 positions that have been requested uh, for reimbursement. And we're just below $2.3 million of our overall budget of uh, $2.5 million. Um, I'm happy to announce that in the last about week, um, we have our initial applicants that had applied uh, back in December. They've been approved for payment. So it's about $515,000 um, in applications that have been approved and, and those reimbursements that are, are going out the door. So that's uh, something we're really proud of that we've been able to kind of mobilize and get this program off the ground and reimbursement uh, to these businesses that have been affected. Um, and you know some of the, the stories that are coming out of the interactions that we're having with these businesses are great. You know, I had a conversation with a business owner down in Silver City, um, and they've taken it to this 
whole other level. They've promoted about four employees. Um, one person they've promoted to be kind of their reservation specialist. So they're learning a new program. Um, and it was a program that has always been available to them, but they really never took the time to train somebody to learn all the aspects of that program and how it can help them um, with reservations. And it came at a really good time because it was coming in to their slow season. So they could really focus on a lot of that training and then gear up for the summer, uh, for the spring and summer season when they're traditionally a little more um, busy. And then of course they have some servers that are learning about wine service, um, presentation, how to garnish plates, so they really took it to this whole other level, um, which is great. And they really credit the program with giving them, you know, that opportunity to kind of kickstart a really robust training program. And some, and they're also, you know, they're providing uh, certificates to their employees after they complete these programs. Um, and it's something that they're doing internally, but they feel, you know, that's something that they, the employee can take with them to other jobs as well and really, you know, be proud of their accomplishments and what they've learned. So it's been, overall, it's been a really great um, opportunity for businesses to take advantage of this reimbursement program. Um, it's gone, um, it's been pretty steady since December when we opened up the applications um, IT has done a fantastic job of also building a program um, that lives within our unemployment insurance system, um, but they've built a fantastic program to handle applications and then, of course, take in the employee information that we're uh, gathering as well. But that's, that's uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's, kind of say, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Hungry. And, you know, I'm not, this is like not an official request from the chair or nothing like that. I just, I want to, I, I would love to know some of those stories. I think we do a lot of great work sometimes, and we may talk about the great work that we're doing, but we don't often hear the individual story, you know, the person who this helped them do that, or the business that this helped them do that, you know, along the way as that information, even if it's just the anecdotes you collect on calls, I think that would be really important for us to hear uh, along the way, if that's okay. It's just, I, I think that's, I think the personal side of those stories is not something we always get to hear. Definitely. So we're collecting a lot of um, information about the business. So, you know, what they're employees, uh, how many employees they had pre-COVID and what they have now, um, if they are still operating at, you know, maybe a limited capacity. Yeah. So we're collecting some of that, but those, those stories are, I think, really important too. Um, yeah. I grow up, I grew up and I live in Taos, um, which is a you know, tourist destination. And over probably the last six months, you know, we've seen about four restaurants close. So we know, you know, that firsthand experience of how vital uh, this program can be to the hospitality and tourism industry. Yeah. And I think it's, um, you know, I think it's been really successful and I think it's helped um, start a lot of conversations. There's another business in Albuquerque that's now interested in looking at on the job training contracts with WIOA. So um, I think it's a good way for us to also market some of our other services um, and kind of bring them into the workforce system and see what, what else is available. But I think that direct um, reimbursement payment to the business is something that was vital for um, a lot of these companies that have really struggled. That's awesome. Well, um, I, uh, DJ, I think you were late to the meeting and I was saying, you know, if we can not put things in chat, but I see that you put something in the chat, but I'm going to read it to make it all okay. But uh, DJ, who's on the board, Mary, uh, was talking about uh, they applied as an events trade show industry, um, and they do hospitality industry events, hotels, uh, uh, restaurants, and airlines, and they were able to use those funds to pay existing employees more and then train them for their personal growth. So, you know, there's a story right there. Reach out to DJ. Um, but anyway, I, um, I apologize, you guys. I have to go. Um, I would like to turn the meeting over at this time to Carlos Romero, who is our vice chair. And you guys be gentle, be nice. He's, he, this is his first <laughs> go round. And uh, I know he's in great hands, 
But um, I just wanted to, to thank you guys for the great work. You know, board, if you guys have questions uh, for Mary right now, um, you know, let Carlos know. And I just wanted to say thank you guys and have a good rest of your day. Carlos, uh, have fun. And by the way, mm -hmm. y'all make him a make him a host so we can see him. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know if it's Wait. better or worse that I can stay off camera. But, um... <laughs> I think I think you're good. All right. Yeah, co you're a co-host now, so you're good. All right. Okay, here we go. Well, good afternoon, right. everyone. So I think I, um I just want to add just one last thing for the board members to understand on this piece with this particular conversation on hospitality and tourism. Um, this was a national issue across the country, and several states were trying to grapple with how to support this particular industry and what was, uh, you know, what was being done. I'm really proud of New Mexico because we stood up this program, and I'm going to let Secretary Cerna say something about that because I know he has something to say about this. Go ahead, Ricky. Thanks, Yolanda. Um, appreciate it. Yeah, in, in, in a little bit, I know I'm going to do a presentation, so I won't try and, and spoil it right here, but I think what we're seeing obviously is a lot of shifting um, um, among the workforce. And so, you know, imagine if they're standing with higher wages to the right, everybody's stepping over to the right. And for um, the tourism and hospitality sector, you know, they're having a hard time backfilling. And so I think we have a, an opportunity here to understand how youth employment plays a role, in retraining and retooling those who haven't worked before and, and certainly creating a meaningful pipeline. But we were just in Carlsbad um, earlier this week and Carlsbad is a phenomenal tourist destination for those that you don't go down there enough. They just have so much work to do, but there as well, uh, they're especially struggling with filling, backfilling, if you will, as tourism employees have stepped over to the right and are now in different occupations. We, we are doing a lot by providing some relief to employees that need money to help train but we really just need to find that pipeline and, and keep it flowing for them. And you froze just a little bit on there, Ricky, but um, to that point, we really responded to this particular industry because it was, it was really getting hit hard. Uh, so out of this is gonna also come a small evaluation around this. Um, so we will be sharing more as we move along on that in terms of what the outcomes were for these individuals and really tracking it. So Mary and her team have done a phenomenal job in terms of tracking the types of industry that are coming in, the number of jobs and the kind of uh, individuals that have actually been partaking in it. And we hope to have just a small report that will be included at the end of the year for us as part of our annual report. We did work really closely with our federal counterparts on this because we were one of the first states to kind of step in into supporting this industry. And we wanted to make sure that they were uh, aware of it. What makes it difficult for us is because of the wages, the low wages uh, that were being paid, they're not considered sustainable. And generally, when we're working or we're making investments with our federal resources, we have to be really cognizant with this. But what we did is we used some set-aside funds, they're called the governor set-aside funds, uh, which gives us a whole lot more flexibility so that we could demonstrate uh, what this could do and how Perhaps maybe the workforce system needs to work with our legislature a little bit differently, too. So when we have to do or we want to do these kinds of specialized things, uh, you know, the importance of general fund and how that could also help us with some flexibility. So so it really is going to give us an opportunity, some lessons learned on on all those ends. And I think we have one hand up, um, Carlos. Yep, I was just going to recognize Bobby Aragon and for a comment. I uh, I just had a question. I hope I didn't miss it. Like, I uh, is there going to be like an advertising campaign to go with the the, the promotion of of uh, creating a pipeline from the young up that you guys are talking about? It's rolling out later this year. So, so Mary, do you, I I know? Do you want to talk a little bit, Mary, about the the actual campaign we did with this particular piece? And then I think Ricky, you've got your hand up as well. So. Yes, thank you. Uh, so we have met with, um, there has been a lot of marketing from uh, DWS and from tourism, because uh, this was a, a collaboration between both agencies 
um, to really help promote this specific program. Um, so we're meeting with the um, Restaurant Association. We met with the Hospitality um, Association to really try to get the word out. Um, locally, we're using our um, local offices and their business teams uh, to meet with the chambers um, in their local areas and also work with, you know, businesses that they've worked with and have established relationships with uh, to let them know about this program. I know that there are additional marketing campaigns um, kind of being rolled out as well um, around the, the hospitality program. Um, and I don't know specific details about that, but especially uh, December and January, we really focused on trying to get the word out to businesses. Yes. Ricky, did you want to add something else? No, I was just going to fill that out. But we, uh, the other additional thing we did in partnership with um, tourism is we did launch a campaign um, on the heels of building a jobs board on the Ready NM website specifically for tourism and hospitality occupations. And so that went live and ads are already being pushed out. Social media marketing has um, <clears throat> commenced. And that's the project that allows for workers to go and find all these positions from across the state in a single location and then get career consultation to be referred. Okay. All right. Great. Well, I think so. We have about 30 minutes left, a little more, and three agenda items. So if I do anything, I'll, I'll make sure we get out of here on time. Um, so uh, the next item is is legislative update, unless there are any objections or I, I don't want to cut short the conversation. But Yolanda, the Deputy Secretary, uh, Yolanda Montoya Cordova is online for a legislative update, including some information about Healthy Workplaces Act and Family Paid Medical Leave Act. Okay, yes. And um, I do have, let's see if I can share my screen. Am I able to share my screen, guys? Yes, you should be able to share your screen, and I made you a co-host if you want to share your video as well. I don't have a video. Can you guys see that? Yes, it looks looks good. Okay. I can see it. Okay. Hang on. I'm not so good at this stuff, so. Okay. So, um, I don't know how to turn this off. Yeah. I just, okay, now, I just... Wanna, I'm sorry to interrupt, but so we're, we're seeing your speaker note version, which happens to me all the time. So I wanted to, I think you can, I'm not sure how to switch it though. I don't either. <laughs> so it, uh, if you, <clears throat> excuse me, Yolanda, if you get out of this, go ahead and just hit the escape. There button. it is. Yeah, there you just go. hit that button. There you go. Yeah, I had, to, I had to hit the swap view. I'm sorry. I'm kind of new okay, to this. <laughs> and I just wanted to, um, actually, this is for uh, Dale Decker, because he had given us a really good idea, too, in terms of the workforce board being up to speed in terms of bills that we were tracking and what was, you know, what was happening for us that that impacted or could have impact for a workforce. There was three specific bills that had direct impact to DWS, uh, Senate Memorial 1 and House Memorial 3, which was about around the Paid Family Medical Leave Act. These are This is a memorial, and it basically is asking us to create a task force to develop the recommendations for the Paid Family Medical Leave Act. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to go into that, and we did receive a small special appropriation to help us support the convening and facilitation of that task force. Inside that particular memorial, it's very specific about uh, the membership on this, and it's also very specific about uh, what we want to include. And our goal is basically to provide a report that talks about what kind of timeline would be necessary, what are the pros, the cons, you know, what is what is necessary in order to fully implement this type of act. Um, <clears throat> it's a very complicated uh, proposal uh, because it does require a, a, a new way of collecting some some a, a kind of like a tax, if you will, uh, of collecting that and also setting up a, <clears throat> a process to build that trust fund and so on and so forth. Several states have actually implemented this, but we knew that it was, what I do know about it is that it's a several year process uh, from beginning to end, from you know an end to end kind of piece that you put into place. And so we'll be, pulling that task force together so we can start um, the conversation around what would that look like and what would be some of the key pieces we'd need to include in some legislation if we move forward 
uh, with that uh, with that particular act. The second one was on the public works wage rates. Uh, we had to get some <clears throat> clarification in there and we just had a minor change in there, but it amended the public works minimum wage act so that <clears throat> we can determine those wages by October 1st and actually have them go into effect January 1. Uh, this one is done by our labor relations division and we essentially collect uh, a number of collective bargaining agreements for the various trade organizations and uh, positions and types of work that are done there. And then we set those wage rates and we announce those and we publish them. And so we set the prevailing wage rates for a particular year using those um, those union agreements and um, and just setting that that information. That's done by the director of um, labor relations. And so we just had some clarification on that too to the act itself. Uh, the final bill was Senate Bill 103. This was a criminal background checks. Um, we've never had this in our department before, but this is gonna help us come into compliance. We have several uh, employees that have access to federal tax information. And in order for us to, to remain in compliance, we have to do this. It's gonna impact a very small number of our employees, uh, something that we've actually been trying to get into play for some time. And so those, um, uh, two of these have actually have already been signed, that Senate Bill 4 and Senate Bill 103. We still don't have a final signature on the Paid Family Medical Leave Act. Um, another bill that did have some indirect impact, but uh, we're going to be watching for, there was a change, a proposal around cabinet secretary language around access plans. And this had a lot to do with just uh, meaningful access to state programs for individuals with limited English proficiency. DWS does a lot of work in this area already. Uh, we do a lot of translation and we do, uh, we're pretty mindful of the type of language that we have available so individuals can have meaningful access to us. Uh, it could still have some indirect impact to us as this comes out if it's signed into law, <clears throat> might have some, some work that we'll have to do, but I think in this one, uh, DWS actually sits in a pretty comfortable spot because we do um, already have to follow some federal guidelines around this. And so we've got some work in there. The third, uh, this, the next one was the Community Energy Efficiency Development Block Grant, House Bill 37. I pulled this one out. Um, this one creates the Community Energy Efficiency Development Block Grant. <clears throat> and we'll be, hang on a second. <clears throat> had, had a frog in my throat. And this one will make grants to counties, municipalities, tri tribal governments, um, and grants are for local energy efficiency development projects that finance infrastructure improvements for affordable housing. And the reason I, I pulled this one out for us is because obviously anything that um, supports or finances infrastructure, there's a workforce component to that. So we wanna make sure that we have enough workforce to do the things that are gonna be called for out of that, um, out of that block grant act. Another one was Senate Bill 1, which was the minimum salary increases for public school teachers and counselors. Um, this one obviously has impact for us because of the workforce uh, pipeline pieces and uh, just addressing the need for that teacher shortage. Uh, so we definitely were watching this one. This one has also gone into effect, has a direct impact, has an indirect impact to us as we're also assisting our local school districts as they're trying to recruit and retain and train uh, for new teachers. House Bill 2, which is the one that um, funds all of state government, there were some uh, recurring increases for personnel costs. So obviously we're gonna have some, uh, some funding that is gonna support uh, state workers, but there was some additional funding that was included in there for our labor relations division, uh, program support and technology to support the implementation of the Healthy Workplace Act, which is the paid sick leave piece. We did ask for some funds so that we could increase the, uh, the number of investigators that we have in there so that we could enforce that, uh, that new act as we're, as we're pushing forward with that now at the beginning of the, the new fiscal year. There's also some money that's uh, included in there. Uh, right now it hasn't been signed, so it still has line item veto, so we don't know if this is gonna go through or not. There's 5 million that's for evidence-based reemployment re case management. And then there's another five million that's pulled out of there for uh, youth reemployment and apprenticeships. And again, we're uh, hoping that those go through. If they do, uh, what's um, 
What's interesting about that money is it's not recurring. So we'll have to see uh, what we can, you know, if it does get through in there, we'll have to be working uh, pretty quickly in terms of the work that we'll be doing with that. And Ricky, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else in terms of uh, the legislation, uh, legislative piece and some information that you might want to share with the group. Uh, no, uh, no, Yolanda, I think you got it covered. Thanks. Okay. All right. So the only other thing that I was just going to say, and I sort of threw it in with that legislative update was just the Healthy Workplaces Act. Uh, some pieces that we've got coming up right now is um, <clears throat> there's going to be a press release to announce a, a new uh, public hearing, which is scheduled for uh, April 5th. This is the second hearing that we're doing on this. We did have a first hearing. We received a lot of good comments. And so we've revised um, the, the rules uh, based on what we received in comments. So we're going to go back out for a public hearing again. And the final publication of these rules is scheduled for June uh, the uh, is, is scheduled for June 21st. And in the interim right now, what's underway is we're uh, drafting posters, presentations uh, for general awareness and education for our employers and also for the general public of what the Healthy Workplaces Act is about and how it impacts individuals. And we're also developing some website information. So that will be included on our website uh, about the new act and how that will impact our businesses and uh, individuals. So we're also in the process of starting to draft the, the new positions and, and, and the work that will be going on uh, with that particular work. And that's, that's all I wanted to, to add there. And I stand for questions if anybody has any. Yeah, so, uh, so we'll start with Roger Montoya. I see your hand raised and we'll have a few minutes for questions. Carlos, thank you. I don't really have a, a question. It's more of a comment. <clears throat> In spending about 25 years working with youth in the Española Valley, Rio Riba County, these are juvenile justice you know, issues. These are kids that are really struggling and fall through the cracks. The very population that we're trying to re-engage in the workforce, those two last items that are non-recurring, I think it was 5.5 and 5 million, are, in my opinion, a place where we must invest. It's the navigation of social services and helping kids, young people really understand that they are supported and that they can stay in long enough to find the results we all know that they need. And I just, I think earlier on when, about a year ago when I first came on this board, I, I brought that up as a, a real deficiency. You know, uh, a case in point, two years ago, I was working for United Way of Northern New Mexico. And I tried diligently, I had a list of 30 young people that I tried to get into the Wet YO program. I only was able to get one young person enrolled. It was impossible for a bunch of reasons, but I think that those two last items mm -hmm. should be less about uh, non-recurring and more about recurring and, and perhaps beefed up, if you will, and some legislative work could help to that end. So I just wanted to put that out. You know, and Representative Matoy, you bring up a really good point because under the federal program, you know, there is that eligibility test on that side because in order to be eligible for WIOA, there's requirements around um, how they, you know, how we can put them into the program and what we have to report back to the feds. The general funds will definitely give us some flexibility, which I think is awesome. Um, and so we definitely will be looking at how we could use that to leverage the federal funds that we do have that also support youth uh, youth employment, but we also know what we receive on a federal level for youth employment is just not enough. I mean, it, it's the smallest amount that we receive on the federal side. So uh, really appreciate um, that, you know, appropriation. And uh, we're going to do our darndest to do the best that we can so that we can demonstrate, um, you know, what can be done if we make those dollars recurring. Exactly. Evidence matters. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, now I'm a policymaker. I'm not so much a hands-on provider, but I know that nexus of opportunity where we can actually get young people to have the results is the best way to showcase. So I'll try to straddle the worlds and, and help as much as I possibly can. Thank you. Yes. And thanks for that extra, the extra context on there. Representative Montoya. So the next item, if we can move on, is to economic development strategic plan. 
And for that, we turn to John Clark, Deputy Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm happy to be here and talk about this. And it's also great to be part of a workforce uh, board meeting again. I unfortunately had to miss a few due to scheduling conflicts. Uh, I also in a little bit would like to call on Joanna Nelson. So if it's possible to move her to a panelist, that'd be great. Uh, there are a couple of things that I'd like to cover uh, that relate to the work of uh, this workforce board. Uh, the first is uh, our regional rep team. Uh, we really want our regional rep team, which are our boots on the ground out in the communities across the state to be our interface with the regional workforce boards, with the local workforce boards. And we have had six, six uh, different regions. Let me see if it's possible to share my screen because I'm not sure everyone is aware of our regions. So let me do this, okay. Okay, thank you all can see my screen now. So um, I'm actually gonna switch to this tab. So uh, this is on our website um, and this shows our six regions and you can hover over any of them and see who the contact is for that region. But uh, this is an issue we faced for a while is that we have six regions. They don't quite match up with the local workforce board regions and they don't quite match up with the regions uh, covered by the seven councils of government or COGS. Um, the COG regions really are, are set up in, uh, in federal, by the federal government and were set up decades ago. And I don't think that they really make the most ideal since today in 2022 for how to split up the state in terms of regions. So I don't think we're probably going to make an attempt to try to align perfectly with the COG regions. Uh, we would love more discussions with workforce solutions about how to align uh, better with, um, with the local workforce boards. But we had asked for doubling our regional reps. And, and our thought was if we moved from six to 12, that we would keep these regions the same, but that we would have two reps for each region, perhaps having one rep concentrate on working with the local communities and then one working with the local businesses. We didn't get the six additional regional reps that we asked for, but we did get five. So we haven't decided yet exactly what that split is going to be. Uh, but as we move forward, we definitely want to continue uh, discussions with uh, Deputy Secretary Yolanda Cordova and others at Workforce Solutions for yeah, how we can make sure that our regional rep team is uh, talking and coordinating with the local workforce boards. Uh, also, um, this is something that really came out of uh, not just the session, but out of our work on our strategic plan, uh, just showing that there's really a lack of capacity in New Mexico in many respects. One of those was that our department needed more boots on the ground in communities. If, I, yeah, I know we have a couple of new members. If anyone hasn't seen our strategic plan, I just wanna point you really quickly to our website. Our website is edd.nemexico.gov. And right here on the main page, uh, you have quick access to a lot of things, including if you scroll down um, to our uh, regional reps team, uh, that I was just showing. If you scroll uh, to the bottom, oh, yep, there it is right there, actually. Uh, but right here is our strategic plan. And if you look at that, you can either review our 20 page or so summary, or we have the entire 406 page document if you wanna look at anything in detail. But one of the other things that came out of that strategic planning, and I can stop sharing now, uh, was that there was a lack of capacity around understanding the needs of industry. And the company that we hired to put together this plan recommended that we set up industry councils. And so that's our goal is over the next couple of years to start setting up industry councils, one for each of our nine target industries. And we're in a lot of discussions right now about exactly how we're going to do that, but we're gonna rely heavily on the private sector to set these up because we want to make sure that this is something that lasts um, permanently that it crosses administrations. And we want to make sure first and foremost that what we're getting out of this is recommendations from the private sector, not government guessing at what private sector needs are. So, with one of these industry councils for each sector, the goal of this is going to be that they're going to conduct meetings throughout the year 
and figure out by the end of each year what it is that they need to make sure that they're successful, make sure that they can grow, make sure that we can attract more companies uh, in that industry sector, but also let us know what the workforce needs are. And they're going to prepare a report that they can submit to the State Workforce Board, the us at EDD, as well as to anyone else. For example, maybe tax and rev if they need uh, specific tax code changes. Uh, but that's the goal with these industry councils. Uh, again, we, we are in the early stages of trying to set these up and we're not gonna try to set up all nine at once. Uh, we're probably going to start with just a few, maybe three to set up those, uh, those up this year. And then depending on how that goes, move forward next year with setting up the remainder. Um, but with that, I'd like to turn it over to Joanna Nelson uh, just to add any updates that she might wanna provide on our strategic plan and on um, Set Force and Seek, which are a couple of uh, councils that are advising us on the updating of that plan. Thanks, Deputy. Hi, my name is Joanna, and great to be here with you all. I am serving as the chair on the Sustainable Economy Task Force on behalf of the department. And through Senate Bill 112, which was established last year, that was the act that, that set up the Sustainable Economy Task Force and the SEEK, what uh, the deputy mentioned, Sustainable Economy Advisory Council. These two groups are tasked with continuing to develop the state economic development plan to transition the economy away from reliance on, on natural resource extraction, further the work that Deputy Clark mentioned about diversifying the economy and developing nine targeted industries that we've identified within the plan. Also, both of those groups are extremely focused on providing equity and inclusion in that work. So making sure that the strategies and the recommendations that are brought forward are encompassing and involving and engaging underserved communities. So that advisory council that I mentioned is made up from representatives that we have picked that are representing underserved communities, as well as eight reps that are uh, representing underserved communities in tribal areas and, and tribal entities. So they are in the process right now, we're brainstorming and compiling an RFP that hopefully will be live very soon to engage with a contractor that will be able to take our plan and engage with the community and engage with, with the public this year to figure out what did we miss what do we need to update? What do we need to edit? Where are we at? And provide some insight into how we're hitting our milestones and, and what are the improvements that we can make so we can be able to, in the fall, give updates to public bodies, including some legislative committees as well, as per the, the plan. Um, so it's really exciting. If, if you have insight to some great organizations that you think would be a good fit for this work, feel free to reach out and, and recommend their names. As well, if you have any ideas for deliverables regarding that RFP and, and that work of, of how to continue developing the plan, um, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much, Joanna, and we're happy to answer any questions that board members have. So we'll open it up for questions, comments, brief discussion. I can't believe you guys are this quiet about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, apparently we answered all the questions. <laughs> Representative Montoya has his hand up, so we'll give the floor to Roger. Representative Montoya, do you want? Yes. To make a comment? Sorry, I was on I was on mute. That's okay. When when you mentioned the idea of developing uh, strategies that directly impact communities of color, communities that are underserved, tribal, and so on. I would love to be able to understand who those organizations are that you have on the list. And just under, because I have a really in-depth um, reach, at least in San Miguel, Rio Riva, Mora, Colfax County area directly, because I'm a community outreach person before I was elected in a very broad way. 
just to understand who's on the list and, and how I might be able to support broadening it or deepening it or, or shaping it in a meaningful way. That, that's great. Thank, thank you, Representative Montoya. And I'll ask uh, Joanna to uh, follow up by sending you uh, via email um, the uh, the list of members. For anyone who, who wants to see, that list is on our website. We have uh, the list of members of both uh, the Set Force uh, Committee as well as the SEEK Advisory Council. And um, uh, about half of the members of SEEK are tribal representatives. And we also uh, both uh, uh, we make both sets of meetings available to the public, but really seek uh, this uh, group that also is representing uh, these communities of color, underrepresented communities. We intend for them to do the majority of the heavy lifting in trying to make sure that the, the plan does work for those communities. And we're encouraging anyone who wants to attend to join those meetings. They're not very structured. There's a, a lot of chance for open dialogue. So there's a lot of opportunity for anyone, even if they're not a member of SEEK, uh, to join in the meetings and provide input. We would love that. So we also have all of those meetings listed in advance on our website as well. Uh, so uh, please, Please reach out if, if you have anyone you'd like. Um, uh, please send them our, our website address or put them in touch with us and we can make sure that they're aware of uh, the next meeting as it comes up. Excellent, thank you. So I well, think we're well, ready in the last 10 minutes. So if there's not any other, uh, is, I'm not sure Representative Montoya, if, that, if that's a new hand raise, but I wanna make sure we give uh, Secretary Serena some time for this last not, item. Sorry. Okay, just checking. So I think then we can close up with the, because uh, there are no public comments, so this will be our last item, um, the unemployment insurance update by Secretary Serna. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to open up a PowerPoint presentation, and I've only got about uh, six slides. Um, <clears throat> second. Okay. All right. Do I need to do my switch around too? Yeah, you do. Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning. Yep. Eight more minutes. Good morning. I don't want to keep everybody from lunch too, too much. So I just want to go through a few things, especially because um, my favorite slide keeps, uh, keeps getting better. At least I've shared this with you before and it's been updated since a number of times, and this is the update on unemployment insurance claimants that are receiving benefits through February 21 of uh, this year. And uh, you'll see that we have now dipped below 8,000 claimants, which is um, the lowest going back to the end of 2018. As you may have read, the last of the federal extension programs um, ended on the 19th, which was just uh, some additional weeks. We had about 2,500 claimants hanging on there. Um, so um, that's where we are. This slide here, just an update on uh, employment comparisons, the number of New Mexicans employed now compared to um, January of 2020. We still see a gap of 36,000 or so workers. That gap is closing um, surely. Um, and certainly, you know, we're, we're interested in that number, but more importantly, how it breaks down, um, how it breaks up by occupation and industry, which I will show you in just a bit. Um, this slide here talks about the jobs gap. So if you kind of see, you know, even if we were to fill um, or we were to bring employment up to pre-pandemic levels, we'd still have a gap of about 50,000 or so jobs, um, as you're aware, even pre-pandemic, and as was talked about earlier by, um, uh, by uh, the, um, hospital, so, so the hospital association is, you know, we had gaps, right, in healthcare occupations, the uh, gaps in IT occupations, education-related industries, things like that. So we, we continue to have um, uh, gaps, and, and the, the challenge in front of us, of course, is these are typically occupations that you can't just do. Uh, because you decide to, we, we're going to have to work on pipelines and training. So, um, but like Troy said, you know, we're working on, on some strategies for those in, in healthcare. This here, of course, is that breakout. Where do we see the, the, the total loss of jobs? So we're here, we're comparing December to December. 
uh, of, uh, nine, of 19 and 21. And so you'll see that this table represents just total employed individuals in these industries. So at the very bottom again, uh, we're seeing trend in gaps, um, local government employment, leisure hospitality, healthcare of course continues to be a priority. And uh, then if you kind of go up towards the top, you'll see in construction and retail trade where they've either closed the gap or now employing more um, New Mexicans than they were back in 2019. The same in transportation, warehousing and professional and business services. So. This table here shows you the industries that are uh, are catching up to where we were a couple of years ago and those that uh, surely still see gaps. And, and what we've been doing as we visit communities across the state is ask you know, a few questions, primarily, um, you know, are you posting these jobs and, and not getting good applicants? Um, are you reducing the number of jobs you're gonna have moving forward indefinitely or are you kind of in a valley right now where you're not sure if you're going to have the capacity to fill them, but you may in the future? And that's that's part of the outreach that we've been doing to employers because then we can surge around getting those positions filled in partnership with um, the employers. Um, one question that's come up very often, obviously, is the the uh, the movement of workers uh, within industries and outside of their pre-pandemic industry. This table here looks a little tricky, but um, what you'll do is find those um, those uh, sectors with the longest blue line show stability. So starting at the very top, you'll see utilities, right? 83.4% of those workers. When you compare the quarter uh, in the quarter one of 2020 with um, quarter two in 2021, there's very little movement from those workers outside of that sector. So if you come down below the first half of the graph, admin and support, for example, you're seeing a lot of mobility. And the orange line shows the movement and the gray line shows uh, perhaps these people aren't working at all right now. So arts and entertainment, accommodation, food service, um, and retail, uh, real estate, and even retail trade are the sectors where uh, we're, we're working with employers obviously to create pipelines, backfill where their workers um, have now pivoted to other sectors in the workforce, uh, likely to earn uh, a higher wage. So um, that uh, outreach that I was talking about has really been in, in partnership with the tourism department, ECECD, higher ed, human services department, because we see just clear overlap in, in the resources that we're providing. Uh, so over the past couple of months, we've done outreach events with employers in Roswell, Alamogordo, Las Cruces. We were in Carlsbad earlier this week. Uh, the governor's office is, is, is on the same path. In fact, we'll be in Penasco up north in a couple of weeks to talk there with community leaders about how you know, our agencies come together to really address their economic reopening or their economic development needs, employment and workforce needs. And it's been eye-opening. We've identified some childcare deserts. We've identified a space, you know, spaces where we need to come in with state resources. And then we've identified communities where we really just need to facilitate collaboration because they have the resources. But we'll continue to conduct this outreach. Um, hopefully we can be out in the Northwest part of the state sometime very soon. And again, what this is all about um, is, you know, we have information and data obviously, but we don't know how that translates to day-to-day -day hardships for employers. And then we typically follow these, um, these outreach events with a uh, hiring event. So for example, uh, yesterday in Carlsbad, we, we, uh, we conducted a hiring event locally so that um, we can try and fill some of those vacant positions. I just did wanna provide an update on how uh, we've, uh, we've started to work on pandemic driven recession triage and, and how we're using what we now understand about the surge in UI claimants to be better moving forward. One of the big projects we're working on, and in fact, we're gonna be working on a grant that's due at the end of this month, is gonna be aimed at combining our employment services staff with our unemployment insurance functions. And we're contemplating the idea of those staff being one and the same, so that our offices are providing unemployment insurance assistance as a service, but the, the ultimate goal is reemployment services. So we're looking at that project. Um, ongoing cross-training of our workers, not only at DWS, but with outside agencies is gonna be key. And that's gonna be a priority for us. 
And one of our downfalls uh, admittedly was uh, not being strong enough in, in US DOL guidance and program administration. So we're actually creating staff positions within the agency that help us identify when um, system requirements are necessary and policy requirements and how they actually work in ha hand in hand so that when we roll out a program, the system functions correctly and we're adjudicating um, in accordance with policy. And then, of course, our, our data-driven workload management is key, everything from how we understand how well we manage call flow to um, how we staff and how we, uh, how we essentially um, address items that come after uh, claims are filed. And then, of course, strategic workflow management helps us clean up. We, uh, we, we surely are serving far, far less claimants than we have in many years but we still have a lot of work to do from appeals to overpayment waivers, outstanding adjudication items, help start tickets, you name it. So strategic workflow management is helping us best use the resources that we have at the agency. So these are just high level, uh, if you wanna call them lessons learned and projects ongoing that are helping the agency right now um, get prepared for something similar in the future, but also address a lot of the remaining workload that came from the last couple of years. And that's it, um, uh, Mr. Chair, um, Workfor Workforce Board, if you have any questions, I'll certainly um, yield my time to you all. Thank you so much. I know we're at time and that, that was a lot of data. I appreciate ending on that much data, um, but I'll open the floor, uh, but I, I think we, I wanna make sure we move to adjournment close to on time. Does any anyone questions? have any questions? It's good to know that uh, UI is not like front and center with us right now in terms of everything that we're doing, but that we're seeing that trend line. And Ricky, I'm glad that you're getting below that piece and that our numbers are looking so much better. Absolutely. And I'll be sure that John sends this out to you all uh, so that you can digest it a little bit more. And, I'll, and you want to give me a call or shoot me an email, I can answer any questions. All right. That's good news. I was just going to note that wasn't in the packet, but I definitely, for one, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in seeing that data a little bit more. So with all of that, we'll, we'll draw it to a close and adjourn. Um, thank you for your attention and for bearing with a, a rookie MC, but I think we made it. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you, guys. Have a nice day. Bye.